Our next guest speaker is Mr. Ted Mitchell, the President of the American Council on Education. His background includes service as the U.S. Undersecretary of Education and the President of Occidental College in California. As a person that I have followed and admired for years, uh, Mr. Mitchell is one of America's strongest leaders in higher education. He brings a wide array of student uh, experience and accomplishment with a longstanding focus on student access and success. He is very innovative in the way that he looks at how higher ed can serve and change and adapt to today's modern times. And it is such my honor to be able to turn the screen over to him um, so that you too can share and hear his insights. He will, in fact, I believe, change the way in which you look at your institutions and the power that you have to actually serve students in a greater way possible. Gosh, Becky, thank you. That's, that was way, way too kind. And um, for all of you uh, who are joining us today, I've learned most of what I know about this area from Becky. And just listening to you talk about CSU Global is, as always, inspirational. Congratulations on, on what you're doing and what you're, and what you're going to do. Um, but let me, let me begin with what I think is uh, the paradox of the current moment in higher education. Um, first, I think on the, on the positive side, uh, the need for higher education uh, for individuals and for society has never been greater. Uh, I think that the, you know, the numbers, the research numbers are very clear uh, that 70% of the jobs that are going to be created in the next 20 years, this comes from Tony Carnevale at Georgetown, uh, will require uh, some post-secondary uh, education degrees or, or certificates. Uh, that 70% number is important because it's also the wage premium. Um, between higher education and uh, um, a, a high school graduate. Economists have been looking at this for a while and the numbers remain pretty stable that a college graduate will earn a million dollars more over their lifetime uh, than, uh, than a high school graduate. So uh, the, the premium for individuals is clear. I would argue that the premium for society is equally clear. Uh, we know that uh, in order to have a well-functioning democracy, we need to have an edu educated citizenry. And as the world becomes more complicated, uh, our education resources need to help people understand, oh, just to pick one, the difference between fake news and real news. They need to be able to think critically about arguments that are put forward to them. Similarly, we all need to be productive and, and careful members of our communities, and higher education is important in creating that social benefit as well. So um, that's a part of the paradox. The other part, though, is more troubling. Uh, higher education has rarely been under the kind of fire that it is under today. Uh, the, there are a, a number of narratives, and love your, to hear whether these are affecting the way you think about higher ed, but there are a number of narratives at play that really call into question the fundamental value of higher, of higher education. I mean, we hear that uh, there's just declining confidence that the, the public surveys that the Pew Research Institute and other, others have done have demonstrated that the, the, the perception of higher education is deteriorating. Families, particularly, um, Becky, the first generation families that, that you reach out to are feeling that college is not within their reach uh, or that it's too expensive. Um, and lately, there's been a political polarization in attitudes about higher education. Uh, in fact, the, one of the latest uh, surveys showed that less than half of those who identify themselves as conservative Republicans believe that higher education is playing a positive role in society. That's unprecedented. And so these narratives are the other side of the paradox. It's never been more important, never been uh, under fire. When you dig a little bit, we've done some surveys at, at uh, uh, ACE, when you dig a little bit about where those narratives are having the biggest impact, I think quite troubling, they're having the biggest impact among um, white working class, low income, potentially first generation, and young Americans, 18 to 34. Now, that's really the, uh, one of the questions that earlier was about uh, uh, students as a, as a market. I mean, that's really, it continues to be an important part of the marketplace for, for higher education, and for us to be losing ground there uh, is, is quite significant. Um, so what's this all about? And I want to talk about uh, a couple of things. So first of all, to give you a sense of, 
of, of the American Council on Education. And this is a new new job for me. I've been in it for all of two months. So I'm going to try to explain uh, ACE to you, and, and I'm going to listen to what I'm saying. Uh, so ACE uh, is the coordinating body for American higher education. We represent several thousand institutions, uh, associations across the board. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, we um, see the great variety of higher education in this country, from uh, the small liberal arts colleges in the middle of the country to uh, CSU Global to major research universities in metropolitan areas. Those are all of our members. And so uh, when, when we look at the field, we look at the experiences of thousands of institutions and literally millions, millions of students. So I think that this has given us as an organization, certainly educating me, it's given us a sense of what's working and what's not working and where there are some things that we need to, uh, to do better. So um, I think that if you look at those narratives, uh, one could say, well, we're just not telling our story well enough. And whether it's CSU Global or a Little Occidental College out in Los Angeles, every day there are transformative experiences that students have uh, that uh, sort of give support to that first part of the paradox, that higher education changes lives. Uh, it makes, uh, uh, gives people opportunities that they didn't have before, helps them feel better about themselves and their communities. That's all really good. So you could think of this as a communications problem. Well, we just need to tell those stories better. We do. And I think one of the exciting things about today is that this is a part of that, a part of that storytelling. But I think um, we need to also be uh, serious and understand that in each of these negative narratives, there is a nugget of truth. And we need to do all we can to change the way higher education meets the needs of the non-traditional or post-traditional student. I think that's the name of the game. Uh, so what are some of those things we need to be honest about? First of all, we have a completion crisis in the country. Becky, I don't know if you talked about this before I got on, but 50% of the people who start higher education, and then let's, let's pause on that for a moment. These are people who have said with their feet and their pocketbooks, I want a college education, but 50% of them don't finish. That's just not good. So when you look at some of the deteriorating public confidence in higher education, you got half of the people who started and don't finish, what are they gonna think? about their college experience. It's no wonder that we're getting some, we're getting some pushback. Um, cost is a real issue. And one of the things that, that I think really marks CSU Global as a different kind of, of enterprise is, uh, Becky, is the ability to keep costs to students low. And, and, and I hope that others uh, will, will follow, follow your model. Um, but uh, stepping back a half a step, uh, over the last eight years, since the beginning of the Great Recession, states have disinvested from higher education. They've cut their state appropriations. It's true in Colorado uh, in, in a major way. Uh, it's also been true across the country. On average, uh, states are now spending 35% less on higher education than they did uh, before the Great Recession. Um, and where does that money come from? Well, it comes from program as universities cut their budgets, but it also adds to tuition costs. And so students and families, particularly low income, first generation students and families are having to bear more and more of the cost of higher education. We need to be honest about that and we need uh, to, to, try to, to try to tackle it. Um, we certainly saw this uh, during my time uh, in, in the department, but um, higher education has not done as good a job as it can to police itself, to make sure that institutions provide a quality education to everybody who enrolls. And uh, um, you know, this has been a particular problem in the for-profit sector. Uh, and uh, um, whether it's the federal government or state governments or the accreditation process, which is a peer review process, I think all of those need to have a sharper focus on quality so that students know that when they enroll in an institution and when they succeed in getting a degree, that that degree is gonna have value in the marketplace. So we need to take that seriously. Um, and then there are some um, deep plumbing problems that we need to work out. And I'll just mention one and then I'll stop. Uh, and that's transfer credit. And love to, love to know as we get into the Q&A in the chat about people's experience with transfer credit. Um, transfer credit is um, broken. 
uh, we do not have a standardized system, and maybe we shouldn't ever have a standardized system, but we don't have an effective system by which students can transfer credits that they've, they've earned in one institution uh, to another institution. And this is another piece of the kind of friction that makes it hard for people to complete their degrees and uh, um, sort of lowers general confidence uh, in, in higher education. 35% you know, of students will transfer um, or, or will take courses in, a, in another institution other than their home institution. Uh, and most of them, when they try to transfer those credits, run into some, some, form, some form of difficulty. So um, those are all issues that I think we need, to, we need to face in one way or another in ACE as an organization is working with our membership uh, to, to, to um, uh, advance the ball and, and coming up with solutions and fixes on those. But at the heart, I think all of these become even more pressing when we overlay the demographics that Becky was talking about, the, the, the post-traditional the post -traditional student. Each of these pain points becomes more acute uh, for students who bring a very different profile uh, than the image that we have in our head of the 18-year-old uh, who gets dropped off. Uh, uh, my daughter just started college, and so this is vivid in my mind. She is a pre-traditional student, so we dropped her off at college, helped her set up her dorm room um, with, you know, good luck and hard work. In four or five years, she'll be done. But that's not the normal student today, right? Uh, um, as you said, Becky, 75% of uh, um, today's college students uh, do their classwork while juggling uh, parenting, working or both. Uh, and that's just extraordinary, 75%. Um, 40% attend uh, school part-time. Uh, students work on average 20 hours a week. So school, half-time job, that's a lot to balance. Add kids to that, add commuting time to that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough road. 38% uh, 30, 30, of today's undergraduates are older than 25. And so that brings uh, an attitude and a mindset to the work that's very different from somebody who's just a post high schooler. Um, and uh, uh, almost half of today's students are independent students. That is, um, they, you are on your own financially. They are not dependent in their, in, in their family's tax setting. Um, and so what that says to me, um, even as a former residential liberal arts college president, and we'll get into it a little bit in the last part of the conversation, is that if we want to reach these students, the surest way to failure is to try to do things exactly the same way we've always done them. Um, in fact, it's the reverse, and this is where risk and innovation uh, comes into play. We need to embrace the idea that to reach the post-traditional student, we need to do things differently. And this is where technology plays, uh, plays an, important, an important, important role. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about um, online uh, and let's talk uh, a little bit about some of the other things that more traditional institutions are doing. Um, a couple of the questions were about uh, um, the kinds of supports that CSU Global provides and other institutions provide. I'd like to talk about um, technology as a major uh, um, set of solutions for the post-traditional student. I want to do it in two ways. Uh, I'll get to online delivery and online assessment in a moment, but let me talk first about um, some of the less sexy ways in which technology is changing our ability to serve non-traditional students. Um, uh, you've all heard the phrase big data. It means uh, something to everybody that's slightly different. In, in the context of higher education, we're now able to collect data about student progress over a long enough period of time to develop some pretty strong predictive analytics of um, what danger signals are for students who may or may not um, be succeeding. And so um, tr even some traditional brick and mortar institutions, uh, uh, Arizona State, uh, Georgia State, the University of Hawaii at Hilo are, are developing metrics by which they can analyze students' progress to a degree uh, and can pinpoint and target specific supports. Sometimes those are online supports. Equally often, they are a call from an advisor uh, and a text from a coach saying, gosh, it looks like you need some help with this, that, or the other thing. Um, the kinds of nudges 
that we now know really work to help keep people on track in school to persist and graduate. Um, those are, those are non-trivial and are um, paying uh, exquisite dividends for institutions that are trying to serve non-traditional students, even in more traditional settings. But let's move over to the, to the other side of the equation and let's talk about online, uh, uh, online delivery and online, online assessment. Um, so if you think back to those impediments that I, that I mentioned, those pain points, let's run through them again. If you think about uh, um, the completion rate, you know, there are 36 million Americans who have some college and no degree. Uh, I think that that's a target market um, worth, worth exploring. Can we use online technology to reach those students and people who are just starting out and increase completion rates? I think some of the evidence uh, that's mounting it from CSU Global and others is that yes, uh, that online delivery, online assessments, online coaching are all very positive uh, levers to try to change the completion rate overall and in particular the completion rate for post-traditional students. Why is that? It's because in an online environment, particularly a self-paced online environment, the learning objectives remain constant. So the, the, the goal line remains constant, but the time, place, and manner by which students learn can vary. That's really important for a working mom. It's really important for uh, a, an underemployed, uh, sort of recently displaced 50-year-old worker trying to get uh, his feet back under him. Uh, it's really important for a 22-year-old uh, returning veteran um, who has responsibilities uh, uh, to keep the household uh, going uh, by putting together one, two, or three jobs. Uh, so time, place, and manner varies. Second factor that we talked about was cost. Online education uh, is um, expensive to develop, and let's not, um, you know, let's not uh, pretend that it's not, but once developed, uh, those costs can be spread um, broadly across a, a large number of students over time, enabling institutions to keep costs, uh, keep costs down. Uh, quality, uh, online education uh, is perceived by um, people across the higher education uh, sector. Babson, uh, Babson uh, College does a survey every year in which it asks uh, administrators to, across uh, all institutions in America, uh, asks them to rate the effectiveness of online degrees and programs. And that's that the confidence in online, uh, not only with employers, as Becky talked about, um, but in higher education itself has increased steadily to the point where in the latest survey that they did, um, more than half of administrators surveyed believed that online programs were uh, as effective or more effective uh, than face-to-face uh, -face programs. When you combine it with some face-to-face, -face, hybrid uh, online and face-to-face, 90% of those administrators believed uh, that the hybrid experience was more effective uh, for students than um, uh, just a face-to-face -face, uh, experience. So the tools and the technology are improving the quality every day. And on the other end, uh, the ability to uh, actually assess learning and track what students know and are able to do is improving as well. So whether you're a federal regulator, a state regulator, or an accreditor, online programs are delivering vast amounts of data that they can use to continue to monitor the quality of, the quality of programs. And now the ones that we still haven't quite figured out yet are the, you know, the transfer apparatus, ways in which those courses can move back and forth. Interestingly, one of the things that ACE does is we evaluate courses not only courses taught by universities, but courses taught by third-party providers like Straighter Line uh, and uh, Guild, come back to that in a second, um, for their viability as college, uh, college credit courses. And uh, so we're seeing online opportunities uh, and third-party opportunities uh, delivering uh, um, transferable credits uh, to students in, in, a, in a reliable way. So, uh, I want to stop on the Guild example for a second. Um, the Department of Education in the, under the Obama administration was keen to take a look at this uh, question of third party providers working in partnership with traditional institutions to provide more opportunities for non-traditional students. Guild and CSU Global teamed up 
uh, and as part of a, a really important experiment underway uh, to look at how that could work uh, to provide more opportunities uh, for uh, for CSU global students going going forward. And I know that even though I'm not in the department any longer, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, to the results of to the results of that work. So I think whether it's uh, uh, cost, uh, whether it is quality, um, and whether it is uh, creating new opportunities for, for uh, the post-traditional student, uh, online learning um, is a, a, a really fertile area for us to, uh, for us to explore. Um, I wanna uh, sort of end by talking about uh, what I sort of see happening in the, in the future. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, the future is here. Uh, and as you look at the numbers uh, of students, the number of institutions that are developing online program or taking online programs and developing online programs, uh, it's, um, it's growing dramatically. I, I do remember my last commencement at Occidental, uh, which was 2005. And in 2005, uh, as is typical in these places, the students walked across the stage, I shook their hand, gave them a diploma, picture was taken, and they went on. Um, so uh, one of my very, very favorite students, after I handed him the diploma, shook his hand. He said, could we do that again? And I figured that he had missed, his aunt had missed the photo. But he said, I said, so what's that about, Ben? And he said, well, I've, while I've been here, I've also been taking MIT's uh, coursework, which had just been put online at that point. Uh, I've been taking MIT's coursework in mechanical engineering, and I'm not going to get a handshake for that. Well, he wasn't going to get a handshake for that. But thinking about 2005 when MIT basically put up sort of raw syllabi and course material to today when uh, at CSU Global and other institutions you have very elaborate, very successful learning management systems that are helping to challenge students at just, in, with, at just the right time, uh, help provide scaffolding at just the right time, help provide embedded assessments that will help students know what they uh, can, can do. Uh, we've come a long way and the market has responded. Uh, today, 30% um, of all enrolled college students of whatever background uh, take at least one online course. And that's divided pretty evenly. Half of those who say that they take at least one course are uh, mixing that with uh, in-person, on the ground, bricks and mortar education. And half, so 15%, uh, of today's enrolled college students are doing uh, programs entirely online. That's a big number. Uh, and it suggests that uh, online is not a fad, uh, but is uh, something, that's, something that's here to stay. So uh, if this growth continues, what's it gonna look like? Um, one of you challenged uh, Becky to talk about what she was most excited about in the next, in the next five years. So uh, let, me, let me roll mine uh, through for you. Uh, so, so one is, I think, at its base, um, we will continue to develop uh, and the tools will, will continue to embody uh, a more careful, adaptive uh, uh, process whereby uh, students learn at their own pace, uh, they're provided with new challenges at their own pace, they're provided with supports and scaffolding uh, to help them over the rough spots. And that that will all be done because of the predictive power and the analytic power of the underlying technology technology platform. So I see us getting better and better at that over time, uh, and that having important implications for uh, students who are uh, in entirely online programs and don't have access, uh, um, immediate access, physical access, might have video access or uh, tech, text or chat access uh, to counselors, but who, who um, can be encouraged in a variety of ways. Um, second is that I think that we are learning um, through that process to unbundle what we expect of, of different people in uh, um, colleges and universities or these higher education organizations. So I think we are beyond the point at which the faculty, uh, the PhD historian or the PhD chemist is responsible for advising delivery of instruction, assessment of student learning, job counseling and placement. I think that we've begun to disaggregate those in important ways and to professionalize some of it. I know that when I was a college professor, I was not the advisor you wanted. 
um, because I just didn't know enough about the full range of, of programs uh, where I was working. And a professional advisor can up that game significantly uh, for, for students and, and for, their, for their families. Similarly, uh, more attention to the bridge uh, between the end of a, of a collegiate career or certificate and the world of work, um, that is becoming a much more difficult terrain to, to, um, to navigate. And professionals uh, in that work can not only help people find that first job, but as we talked about, uh, as, as you talked with Becky about earlier, um, find those lifelong uh, learning, those lifelong learning opportunities. Uh, so I think that that's uh, number one is better technology. Number two is a disaggregation of the workforce. Um, number three is this idea of lifelong learning. Um, I think we are also done with the notion that higher education or a degree is an inoculation that lasts you a lifetime. Uh, it's not. It's an induction into a world of lifetime challenges where we will all need to refresh our learning from time to time and institutions will need to be able to respond to that. We'll need to help institutions do that by changing some of the ways in which we provide, for example, federal financial aid or state aid to be able to be a lifetime experience rather than just a six year or four year experience. Um, but uh, uh, we'll, you know, we, we, will, we will tackle, we will tackle that. Um, next is, uh, I, I'm very excited not only about big data, but about the uses of various kinds of um, AI and virtual reality in higher education. Uh, I think um, one of the things that we've thought about for a long time, when we've thought about uh, online learning was um, not just the, the convenience for people who have complicated lives, but the imperative to get really good educational experiences if you are living in a small rural community. And I think that we're getting there. And I think that AI and virtual reality uh, will continue to mature and have uh, critically important uh, implications for the way we deliver, uh, we, the way we deliver higher education. And then finally, I think all of this um, comes together as we think, as Becky led us to think about and as CSU Global is doing, thinking about um, this lifetime learning as a, a period of, in which we accumulate knowledge in different places in different ways that is then collected in a, um, I don't even wanna call it a transcript, but a, a bank uh, that shows what we know and are able to do with um, learning certificates from a variety of different providers, from a community college, from a four-year state institution, from a third party uh, accredited or authorized um, provider and, the, and workplaces, and that those will become the sum of who we are uh, in, our, in our educational background. And as we get better at our assessments, they will reflect not just the proxies of learning, a BA in this, a BA in that, but the skills that we learn in different, in different classes. And that will be the magical moment in which uh, higher education is really attuned to the needs, first of the learner, and second of the employer, the community, the family, the society, uh, that needs more than ever before a very highly educated population. So those are the ideas that I hoped we could start with and uh, uh, look forward to your questions and comments and uh, I stand ready to learn a lot from you. So thanks. Thank you very much, Ted. Wonderful, wonderful comments. And we appreciate uh, you taking the time again to, to join us today and share those with us and, and your thoughts for the future. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, you can go ahead and ask questions of Dr. Mitchell down at the bottom using the Q&A feature. Um, in the bottom taskbar. So we've got a couple of those coming in we can start with, but I encourage you to keep submitting those there. Um, our first one for you comes with um, the question of thoughts on competency-based education. Will we have a nation having growing or shrinking acceptance of accepting those and why? Yep, uh, great. It's a great question and, and um, uh, probably could have done the last 30 minutes on just competency-based education. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Um, I think that uh, moving, from, move, moving to a system in which uh, student mastery of material and skills is the uh, coin of the realm is a, a very important move. I think that the acceptance is going to grow. Uh, I, I know that um, 
the uh, national organization, the Competency-Based Education Network, uh, CBEN, has seen a dramatic growth in its membership. And I know that institutions, even, even uh, traditional institutions, are doing more and more uh, in the area of competency. Uh, the um, question of internships uh, at uh, CSU Global uh, came up uh, a little bit ago. And I think that internships may be a, uh, a way in for a lot of the competency-based work, because I've, even the most traditional institutions have recognized the active learning, uh, whether it's in the workplace or uh, out in a dig, uh, an archaeological dig, that those those are um, quite critical to engaging students. Maybe more millennials now than uh, than, than before, but uh, that kind of active learning uh, lends itself to competency-based assessments. So that may be one of the ways in which uh, that uh, continues to progress. The other way will be uh, more accurate, more timely, more embedded assessments of what students are learning as they're going through a computer guided or, or, or digital content. Great. And along those same lines, our next question comes from Teresa. How critical is it for institutions to provide credit for learning and experiences in the workplace? Um, so I, I think especially on the, you know, you take an institution like uh, Northeastern um, that has long had its co-op program and uh, the president there is produced a sort of a new plan for Northeastern that doubles down on the idea of workplace learning connecting to the academic learning that takes place in the in the classroom. And so that's one model is to make that connection explicit. Another model is um, uh, for uh, workplaces and employers to think about uh, their own training as uh, in, in a context of coursifying it. Uh, and that ACE will, will help companies evaluate uh, their uh, ongoing training programs for college credit. And that's been quite, quite useful and, and quite interesting uh, to help uh, workplaces actually construct uh, workplace experiences and learnings that then can be transferred back into, uh, um, higher, into higher education. Um, we see every evidence that that uh, that's going that's going to grow. So I think that, that both in the pre-degree uh, time and in the post-degree time, uh, the connection between work-based learning and uh, a real identifiable set of skills is going to be critical. And then the credentials come in as a way for uh, Andy, you or I, to be able to say, yeah, you know, we, we did this work uh, at the leadership training program at Jiffy Lube. And so we need, uh, we want to get um, uh, both literal credit for that, but we also want that to be a, a legitimate part of our learning record when we uh, go out and look at new employment opportunities. Wonderful, great. Our next question comes in that most of the jobs today, including most of ours, will disappear in a, in a few years, thanks to automation and technology and things. How can hired, hired educated people um, be prepared for such tremendous changes? Yeah. So it's a great it's a great question and is you know one of the biggest questions I think of our moment in, in history, and we've uh, spent a lot of time talking with um, employers with the chief learning officers at, at large at large corporations and uh, they say two things pretty regularly, uh, very regularly. One one is uh, that lifetime learning is not a luxury any longer, and so we will all need to expect. Uh, to retool a number of times in our in our lives and careers and higher education I hope will respond to that by developing lifelong learning structures that uh, don't exist in as many places as I would like that to be the other thing that they say to us is that um, there is a there's a distance between the skills that will help you get a first job and the skills that will help you adapt to the changing environment and while the skills that will help you get a first job may be technical, the skills that will help you respond and be resilient to a very challenging and changing economy are the ones that we typically associate, honestly, with the liberal arts. Critical thinking, the ability to communicate, the ability to work well with, with a broad, broad array of uh, different people, um, the ability to solve complex, um, to, to identify sort of a system of complex ideas and issues. Those are the kinds of skills um, that uh, 
we'll always be rewarded in the economy because those are the kinds of problems uh, that machines are least able to solve. Good. Similar to that, our next question comes in related back to competency-based education too, um, and, and how they're basically focused on some lower level or at least specific skills. So can you discuss a little bit um, how that's an improvement or if that's a downside for, nerd, for the um, connections with creativity and diversi diversifying of experiences? Yeah, so I don't, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And I don't, um, I don't necessarily, I don't think that they are, they are by nature in conflict. I think that a number of the early competency-based um, education programs, especially those that were focused on prior learning, um, did, I think, uh, um, look at lower level intellectual skill sets. And I think that that's changing as we're starting to develop a more robust sense of uh, how one develops competency in something that is decidedly higher up on the food chain, like critical thinking or communication. Uh, and it's interesting, one of the reasons that those are great examples is because they can be embedded as skills in almost any disciplinary environment, right? So you can work on collaboration in a chem lab, you can work on collaboration uh, in a, a sociology class, uh, and if you can identify those skills and the competencies and what, it look, what mastery looks like, it becomes discipline independent, which I think is a very, very important um, breakthrough for competency-based education. Great. Next question comes in from Melanie. She asks, how do you see the scaffolding and more standardized transfer of credit in online higher ed classes impacting K through 12 students, especially underserved ones? Yeah, so um, it's a, I saw that, uh, Melanie, I saw your question come, come up and so I've been thinking about it for a couple minutes. Uh, you know, I think it's, um, I think that there is a real opportunity for higher education to do more uh, to help um, traditionally underserved high school students feel like they belong at college and can do college work. And uh, the, a clear example of that are um, the growing number of dual enrollment programs around the country where high school students uh, can sign up for courses, many of them taught in local community colleges, and get high school credit and college credit uh, for those dual, dual enrollment courses. Turns out that um, low income, first generation uh, students of color who engage in dual enrollment courses have a much higher enrollment rate in colleges and a much higher persistence and, and success rate. Um, that just, just getting that confidence built and getting a few credits under your belt so that you don't have to, to uh, uh, pay for more, um, all of that matters a lot. I think online uh, can be another place where uh, high schoolers can take advantage of college level coursework uh, to be able to convince themselves that they can do the work, uh, to develop relationships online with, with peers uh, who are also in the course, uh, and uh, as in the case of dual enrollment, to build up a bank of uh, uh, college credits uh, that they can, that they can uh, then use. It's important to come to your final point, which is about the transfer pathways. Um, I think students need to be careful and clear that when they do that, they're, they're um, taking courses that are already a part of established articulation agreements between institutions so that they don't find themselves having to convince an institution to, to take those credits. And so my, my advice uh, to high school students interested in college credit or uh, um, students who are looking to have, a, a, for example, a community college experience and then a four-year uh, uh, finishing up at a four-year institution is to make sure that the articulation agreements between the institutions are strong uh, and that you will be able to, to transfer those credits. In the meantime, uh, I think it's on us uh, at ACE and across the, the, uh, across the higher ed landscape to make those pathways and those agreements more common than they are today. Okay. Next question comes in anonymously, but they ask, you touched on the idea of developing technology to assist in identifying the need for intervention for students, such as technology developed at Georgia State. Can you share more about the innovative ways institutions are approaching the use of technology in supporting their students? Sure, great, it's a great question. And uh, there are um, 
wonderful institutions uh, that are that are doing that are doing just this. So let me use uh, a couple of different examples. So the Georgia State example, the, their big takeaway was that they needed to professionalize advising, and they needed to give advisors. They hired about a hundred of them. They needed to give advisors a student by student dashboard of what the courses were that the students were doing, how they were doing in the courses, against a predictive model that sort of showed how other students had gone through uh, gone through that program. So um, let's I'm making I'm now making this up. Uh, so if um, you're a Georgia State student and you want to be an engineer, uh, it turns out that one of the uh, uh, make it or break it courses is uh, a uh, physics course. And uh, so if Ted is enrolled in the physics course and it looks like I'm about to get a C in the physics course or my midterm grade is a C, that pops up as a red block on Ted's heat map. And the advisor calls me up and says, okay, um, you just have to know that uh, people who get C's in this physics course don't finish their engineering degree. So let's figure out what we can do, uh, what kinds of tutoring help we can do uh, to get you um, some scaffolding around this physics course because it's a big deal. Um, that likely wouldn't have happened without two things, without the historical data that allowed them to identify this, not only the course, but the grade that was required to be successful, one, and two, um, the ability of an advisor to have a laser-like focus on those hot spots on the heat map to bring resources, uh, bring resources to bear. So um, that's been, that, that model has been uh, adopted by a number of other institutions and I think is, uh, is, is very, very successful. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with how the courses are delivered, just with how um, hot spots are identified and resources brought, um, brought to them. Um, you know, other, other institutions have noticed that uh, LaGuardia Community College, very different from Georgia State. Uh, LaGuardia Community College uh, um, noticed early on that one of the big issues for low-income first-generation students in their community college was actually getting to class. And so um, LaGuardia has a program now that helps, that provides Metro cards uh, to, to students who need that support to physically be able to, uh, to get, themselves, get themselves to class. And that's identified through a variety of, uh, of ways of looking at uh, a student's uh, background and population. The program at LaGuardia is um, uh, known by the acronym ASAP and has, uh, it's not just Metro cards, it's also advising, it's also creating structured pathways for students, and it's um, nearly doubled uh, the graduation rate for low-income students, uh, students of color at LaGuardia. So it's, um, this is all moving um, pretty quickly. I think the big challenge across the sector is sharing information about which of these things work. We're, we're notorious uh, as a sector for doing really good local innovation, but not spreading it. Uh, and so uh, I think that that's a, it's a, certainly a role that we would like to play at ACE, but there are networks of institutions that are also self-consciously learning from uh, each other. The University Innovation Alliance is, is one of those, um, but I'm bullish on, uh, on, on um, the way institutions are using technology tools to help students learn. That's wonderful. And it ties right into our next question, actually, too. Linda wants to learn a little bit more about your impressions of hybrid programs versus online only and how those compare to kind of the methodologies of traditional brick and mortar. Yep. No, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, it's a place where the, uh, the technical research is out. We don't, we don't know. Um, there's been, there have been a couple of studies that have uh, looked at online, all online versus all uh, in the classroom. And um, those uh, studies showed a, a pretty similar outcome for, for students. There's other research that suggests that for um, uh, some low income populations, online alone is not as good as online plus, um, plus in person. And so uh, we need to continue to test out uh, that research. Um, I mentioned earlier that, and it's not evidence of student learning, but it's evidence of sort of university administrators' attitudes. They are far more uh, energetic about hybrid than they are about online only. About 90% of 
uh, university administrators believe that hybrid is better than uh, or equal to all brick and mortar, all, all seat time. Uh, whereas just a little over 50% um, believe that all online is superior to all offline. Okay. So we'll continue, we'll continue to, uh, to work on that as a, as a field to try to get a, not just a which is better, but which is better for which populations under which circumstances, because this is really all very, very conditioned on the, on the context of the individual learner. Excellent. Yeah. When you're looking at those different models and you're considering um, just the, some of the innovations you talked about today from online learning and competency, um, how does that affect financial aid when you're talking about in-school deferment and how the currently policies are set up? Yeah, um, so currently the policies are set up uh, to um, around the, the rather traditional concept of credit hour and seat time. And so um, while there, I mentioned the, the equip experiment about third party providers, uh, there is another um, experiment going on in the department about competency based uh, education. But, but by and large today, um, student financial aid is uh, student financial aid is available to students who sign up for at least 12 units of, of credit, whether that's online or offline, uh, 12 units of credit um, and uh, who maintain satisfactory progress through those uh, through through those programs. There are institutions that are um, developing competency based programs, but putting them in a box of credit hour and so the, the competency-based assessments and content are often available in a traditional credit hour environment, but the, the credit hour uh, continues to be the coin of the realm when it comes to uh, uh, federal aid. And that includes eligibility for financial aid and uh, the ability to um, uh, acquire an in, in-school in uh, deferment. Great. And we are almost at the time. We'll let you take a break from talking, but we have one final question here from Teresa. I would appreciate your thoughts on how institutions might better prepare for the millennial generation. We hear a lot about gamification of curriculum as the next extreme disruption. Can you share your thoughts on the future there? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, uh, Teresa. And um, uh, in my, um, in between the different academic posts I've uh, held, I was a, uh, worked in Silicon Valley uh, as a venture philanthropist seeding um, uh, education startup companies. And so spent a lot of time um, thinking about this uh, when I was out there, we had a, a, a game game lab that we built with Zynga, uh, and so the gamification of curriculum is um, is real. Uh, it is moving forward. Uh, I think that the advances in um, AI and VR will help uh, the gamification uh, uh, stuff, and uh, I, I think it's going to it'll be spotty in in pockets over the next uh, next uh, next few years. But I think it's I think it's coming. The last investment that we made before I uh, joined the federal government was actually in a, uh, a teacher simulator uh, that was being developed at um, uh, Central Florida. Uh, and so I think that the, the whole area of um, visualization and, and simulations, whether it's in a game context or in a, a real, real world imitation context, uh, is, is, um, is, is going to be a, a big breakthrough. I do think, though, that the, the biggest part <clears throat> of um, adapting to the millennial generation is going to be, as, as Becky talked about, the, the twin uh, factors of the way millennials like to uh, amass information and, um, and information, which is in short bursts and just in time, and the need for lifelong learning. And so I think whether it's gamified or not, the real shift is going to be in the development of smaller bite-sized uh, um, education elements that uh, learners can assemble at any time in their lives to create the, 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 um, the architecture for what they um, need or want to want to do next, whether it is um, becoming an expert uh, uh, chef, uh, learning a new language, um, getting an MBA. I think that all of that is going to become a part of uh, just a, a new mindset about not having to go to an institution, spend four years there and get labeled on the way out. But it's, you know, I really want to, I need to know this now. Where can I go to get it? Uh, where is a legitimate provider? Is there financial aid available? How can I resource it? Uh, I think that that exchange is going to become uh, the, the way we think about higher education in the future. 
Great. So I know we're right at time and we have a couple extra questions. So we'll try to get to those after the event. We'll get those answered one way or another. But I did have one more for you, Ted. Someone asked earlier, what are a few of your top policy goals as president of ACE since it's a relatively new position for you? Yep. Uh, uh, thanks, for the, thanks for the question. So um, I think we, we, uh, we really want to do a couple things. And I uh, started by talking about this, um, this uh, narrative arc. And my first and biggest goal is to work with the field uh, to change the narrative about higher education and to uh, get people who aren't excited about it, excited about higher ed and to understand that there is a tremendous opportunity for individuals and there's tremendous opportunity for us as a, as a society uh, to, if we continue to, if we can invest, continue to invest in higher education. Um, I'm terrifically concerned uh, about uh, equity and access, always have been. It's been the sort of touchstone of, of my career. Uh, I wanna make sure that we're building a system where first-generation students, low-income students, uh, um, students of color uh, are welcome and have success on our campuses. And I know to do that, we've also got to get better at recruiting faculty of color, got to get ready, uh, uh, better at recruiting leaders of color and helping them um, build their skills. Uh, we're going to try to do that at, um, through our leadership programs uh, at ACE. Very specifically, we're um, uh, crazy concerned about the DACA uh, student issue and we want to protect DACA students. And so we're hard at work at that. Um, currently, we think that the tax bill is uh, not going to be helpful to higher education and, in fact, will close opportunity rather than open opportunity. And so there are specific elements uh, of policy that we will also try to uh, get our thumb in on. And then I'll uh, finally, to tie a bunch of the stuff that we've talked to together, uh, talked about together, um, there are policies, uh, financial aid policies at the heart of them that really need to change uh, if um, we're going to be able to help students have a more flexible pathway through higher education. And so that's a little bit longer term, uh, but something that we certainly want to work on in the Higher Education Act. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Very informative and always inspiring. And I'm excited about the work of the American Council on Education under your leadership. Um, we are on board and look forward to supporting Great. Thank you, Becky. Thanks for having me today, everyone.